Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, delighted to have you with us um, uh, for what's our final keynote address of, of the conference. Um, and we're all very excited about this particular keynote address uh, because it's sort of one of our own. Um, but uh, my only, my only um, concern about this morning is that you're going to leave Ireland and you're going to think it's sunny all the time. <laughs> because uh, we've been in this sort of fantasy bubble for the last uh, three or four days. It, it does rain every now and then, um, otherwise we'd be certain it would be known as a green aisle. But anyway, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome um, our final keynote, um, my R. Floss. And my R is a Brazilian family doctor and writer and poet and filmmaker and activist and all round uh, good egg. Uh, she's currently a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo. She's one of the creators of the Rural Seeds Network, so I hope, hope you all get your Rural Seeds t-shirts before you, before you leave. And uh, she co-created and coordinated the Rural Seeds Cafe, Mentor Minty, Rural Health Success Stories, and Rural Videos. So we'd like to welcome her to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here as well. So I just want you to ask, to imagine that you are a rural GP, okay, and well established in a developed country, and you receive a call from your son, and he says that he made a friend with a Brazilian young woman, and she was doing her undergrad. Medical uh, exchange at the at the program at the university at the time at the University of Galway, and he then wants to know if it is possible for her to be an observer at your practice. And the only <laughs> reference that you have at all is your son's call. You don't know her. You don't know what she's doing. You don't know anything about it. So would would you? Give this opportunity to a young woman from Latin America, from a low income country, who is a medical student and with a bad English at that time. Would you take the risk? Because Edward Harty, a family doctor in South Connemara, in Ireland, said yes. And that's how I discovered the rural and the medicine world. I wouldn't be here if Ed hadn't opened his practice. I must say that rural seeds, rural cafe, rural stores, and entertainment, and all other rural things that we have been doing would not have happened, not in the way it is. So I spent almost a year and a half observing Ed's work, doing the night homes, the weekends, the low homes, and the days of the week in the Connemara region. And being here today for this keynote is a way for myself to thank this special island. That's part of my story. And to thank the Brazilian government under the Working Party administration at that time with the Science Without Borders program. Uh, before that dark times that you might come to. Uh, spacing that gave me the opportunity to study abroad a few years ago. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Ireland. <laughs> Before I start talking about everything, I must share a bit of my thoughts of being a human at this world at this time. Especially during the last two to three years. It has been such a quest. I know that you know that. And I do really want you to have a deep breath in yourself. Because to breathe means a lot. And uh, especially coming from sorry, especially coming from Latin America. And uh, the challenges with misinformation and the, being the front line of COVID. I'm exhausted so many times of overwork and needing to deal with insecurity, food insecurity after the price of food raising and people getting more and more hungry. The increase of family violence 
Further, the superposition of dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and climate change. And we think and talk about equity. When we think about it, it seems we are always talking about inequity, isn't it? Uh, so how can we ignore that our world is in war? It's not just just about Ukraine. It's about the whole world is in war, and that our governments are making bad choices for people. That even when we have a vaccine, we have it. Just 15.2 percent of people in low-income countries have received at least one dose of COVID vaccine. That eight out of ten people uh, living below the international poverty line visits in rural areas, and they must say they are more women. And rural poor is unfortunately a brutal reality. And I must say, this map made was made before the COVID pandemic. It's probably worse. Maternal mortality rose. 77 percent in the last two years in Brazil, and it's worse amongst black women. And then the Brazilian leadership said to say that the economy is more important is saying that the ship matters more than the crew. Isn't that right? Like, I even connect from this um, little temple, and they always think about that. So, I think we are like a roller coaster. I feel all the time, and it's a huge privilege for us to be here today. We survived it, we got vaccines, and we were able to travel. A traditional food in Brazil is beans and rice. Almost all Brazilians would eat it daily if they could. Usually, it's the basis of the meal, and it is the basics. Talking and reflecting about equity is actually a reminder of why we are here. Why we are here. That's why we need to talk about equity now. It, it's like being the rice and getting back to the basics to sustain life. And I do really want to do some exercise with you. Can everybody stand? Please. So, I would like to ask everybody that's 70 years or older to sit. Life expectancy in Cambodia is 70 years. I would like to ask everybody that's 60 years or older to sit. Life expectancy in Mali is 60 years. I would like to ask everybody that is 20, oh, oh, sorry, 52 years or older to sit. Life expectancy in Central African Republic for men is 52 years. I want to ask everybody that is 34, 35 years or older to sit. Life expectancy of a transgender woman in Brazil is 35 years. Look, look around, how many people would be alive if you were in any of these places or in many of these populations? Is that like you have a city? So life expectancy is just one of the aspects of equity or inequity. So this word is not entirely, I was studying so much when John told me you should talk about equity, I was like, oh my god, how? So it was not entirely uh, clear when this term were coined, this concept, but many healthcare systems, organizations and leaders consider this a star word for, for healthcare. Fact is that it's easier that we say that it's just about health access inequity when in fact are many other health determinants at play. 
there's the region, and people have access to safe water. Do they have access to food? Do they live in a rural or an urban area? Is the country at war? Do the girls and the people with uterus have access to products of menstrual hygiene? Is there a political crisis? Is the president a denialist? So, the Declaration of Constitution in 1946 stated the highest standards to health should be within which to all, without the distinction of race, religion, political beliefs, economic or social condition. Two years later, in 48, after the Nazi Holocaust, Adopted the universal, the UN adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that proclaimed about the rising of health, well being, and the steadiness of social service, food, house, and medical care. We're not just about talking about health service, but all together. And then I'm sure you know in 71, Tudor Hart created the term of inverse prior law that I think we need to remind you in this conference about that and that the availability of Good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need of the population, uh, population survey. In 78, we have the gorgeous conference on primary care in Alma Ata, and the declaration highlighted the inequality between the developed and the developed countries, and termed politically, socially, and economically unacceptable. In the 90s, the concepts and principles of equity and health, and then the Margaret Whitefoot uh, wrote a document articulating and explaining the concept of health equity. We have the Millennium Development Goals uh, to evaluate uh, how countries are advancing health equity in relation to other MDGs. And uh, so, So then we got COVID. And how COVID 19 is showing all these inequities. So, health inequities were conditions that were avoidable and preventable. These were the four industries and recognized such, for example, exposure to unhealthy, stressful living and working conditions. And uh, it should arise from place to place. But then, when we got COVID, we have the public health system. We show, it showed it to us the importance of the public health systems, how they vary with the communities. And even if we have did it well at all, I think we try to do our best. Uh, what resources we, we have? That's what vaccine should be at home and not be. We, I think we shouldn't be discussing about buying vaccines. It should be at home. Well, but then I was just thinking about this equity and trying to think how we will communicate with you, and then this equity has this fairness thing. So, but it's such an umbrella term. I have been searching for visual representations, and uh, I want to share some of you. So, internet is great because it's playing with these images. So, I like this, and then this guy puts the reality where. Uh, the man is mostly like the, the, the man is over seven boxes and the, to watch a baseball game. And the, do you know so that the other one is in a pool? You know, so, but then I decided to think a little bit more about this image. So let's do it. Uh, because I think this image made us think about the height of person, how tall they are as an individual factor. That's work. Well, if you are talking about height, but if it is supposed to be a metaphor for other inequities, uh, because this can become problematic. For instance, if we think about health funding as an example, this image implies that people in low income countries and other marginalized communities need more resources in their health care because they are inherently less capable. They or their families, their communities, are metaphorically shorter and need more support. Well, I also think about defense as a health determinant. And if even people have more resources, they cannot access the game at all. 
Uh, and I was even thinking if the people were countries or represented countries. Sometimes I feel from coming from a low and middle income country. I see the game through the whole. Can you go to the whole there? I do feel that I see the world through the whole. Yeah. But, and that's a big but. That's something that's really annoying me about this image. Where is the woman? Where are they? So just I don't I think it's too 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 problematic and uh, we shouldn't uh, use it, but I hope it's helpful for us to, to think a little bit of, of these ideas of equality and everything. So we're just searching for all other images that could represent equity or inequity. And uh, I found this image interesting for women. And I know how hard it is to be working and sharing our ideas like myself and her today. This is another one for women. Not very sharp to see. <laughs> and this image was taken during the oxygen crisis in 2021 at Amazon States in Brazil. Over 670 Thousands of Brazilians died because of government bad choices for uh, cover management. I live in a country that's warming. This image is from a contest and uh, was about drawing, drawing better images about equity. And at least it uses the idea of community resources about more equally. And uh, this is for myself absolutely the worst of inequity. More than half of the Brazilian population is in a state of insecurity. Family doctors, community health workers, and primary health care teams who represent the front line of our Unified health system in SUS are under major stress facing professional and per personal cooperation. And the implementation of the austerity measures in low and middle income countries during the economic crisis led to frequent achievement of the SDGs related to poverty reduction, improving health, and reducing health inequalities. And hunger has resurfaced as an huge issue at my country. My clinical assessments now include a question about what people face in the best days. Are you asking this for your patients? Part of my salary is going to buy basic food for patients. I cannot write, and you say this very slowly, I can't write a prescription for medication that treats social problems. Of course, that this is insufficient and completely primitive that I buy food from the patients, but it's really difficult. And malnutrition is not a matter just of Brazil. Globally, close to 193 million people are acutely food insecure and in need of urgent assistance across 53 countries and territories according to the finds of your GRFC 2022. And I choose to talk about this because it's for sure one of the big issues of in all practice worldwide. Can we imagine that in the 21, 21st century we would be talking about hunger? About iron deficiency. And this is key for rural areas, and I want to explore it a little bit more. I really think these graphics are really curious, and it explains about global land and food production. And we can see that half of the land is used for agriculture, but only 21% of the global agriculture area is used for human food. So this is one thing that we need to think about because it, I think it's quite obvious that we talk about food and rural. Because who produces the food in the world 
is our rural communities and uh, they safeguard the human food and also suffer the consequences of disrupting, disrupting our climate systems and we are experiencing more floods, more droughts, more food insecurity. And malnutrition in all its forms, undernutrition, obesity and other dietary risks uh, for non-communicable diseases is by far the biggest cause, 90% of ill health and premature death globally. That's why we need to talk about this. We are talking a lot about a pandemic, aren't we? But we are living at synthetic, which is a synergy of pandemics. We have obesity, we have malnutrition, and then we have uh, climate change. And this is something that we need to be talking about. And uh, for just one example, food systems not only drive the obesity and malnutrition pandemics, but also generate uh, around 30% of green gas emissions and cattle pollutions about accounts for over half of those. So we need to be careful and we need to address this in our rural communities. So this figure shows uh, that the contrary drivers of the global pandemics arise from within food, transport, urban design, they say rural design as well, but it's not there, and land, land use systems, which in turn draw from the natural systems and are shaped by the policies, the economies, incentives, and disincentives, and are established through governance mechanisms. The outcomes of obesity, malnutrition, and climate change interact. For example, climate change will increase malnutrition to increase, increase food insecurity from extreme weather events throughout and shifted in agriculture. Likewise, fetal and infant malnutrition increase the risk of adult obesity. I don't really want you to connect this. And the effects of climate change systems are the they define how we deal with this as a governance and as, as a communities. So we are talking here about the double duty and triple duty actions necessary to address the global pandemic. And the WHO estimates that 51 to 67 67 percent of people living in rural and remote areas do not have adequate access to the station health services they need. Uh, and rural regions may more vulnerable by limited healthcare infrastructure, lower rates of vaccination and opposition. Uh, and we are in many ways like the front line also of the pandemic, in the way that we are where it probably is more invisible as well. So it is a rural that cares for the forest, the land that produces the foods but has less access to healthcare and other facilities. We have a big problem here. And it seems that's not fair. This reminds me from when I was talking about equity at the beginning. Recognizing the common origin between environmental degradation and social injustices is that realize that some populations bear greater burdens of environmental health impacts than others is the first step towards identifying priorities and rebuilding institutions that promote and reproduce inequalities and shape living conditions on the planet. Rural communities are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And they are at risk to be disproportionately affected by the direct effects of it. And on the other hand, it's in rural communities also the resistance for addressing climate issues. And much of the production and the climate friendly economies will occur in rural areas, including renewable energy, revigorate local food economies, and changes to, to land use patterns. The rural areas, which include the forests, are one, one of the key elements for us to find ways to get out of this crisis. However, as COVID showed us, there is no easy exit. Actually, who is unable to live or allow it to die 
is the question that turned it back politics. And we live a necro political time. That's why we need to talk about equity. I mean, I use about a bit of this time to talk about the genocide against the indigenous communities of Brazil. It's not just about COVID, it's also about all the other consequences of denialism and economical interests. The consequence of the use of daily treatments for people. We never had a good national action on lockdown or pandemic control. And, you know, to have a lockdown is a huge privilege. Yanomami and Brazilian indigenous genocide crisis is a world crisis because we hold the biggest forest in the world. This animation shows the growth of illegal mining to president stimulation just between 2018 and 21. The COVID crisis was used to make indigenous people more vulnerable in Brazil. And the past environment minister, he ever said that was the time of the pandemic for the cattle to pass, meaning to cut down the forest for the cattle farming. And the research of Mapa Biomas shows that the area occupied by mining within indigenous land has grown 495% in the last 10 years. And this, is, this image is self explained the lines of the illegal minion that appeared in the last years. And is this image that we are once? For the biggest forest in the world, the dead nature is an artist from it's a Brazilian indigenous artist called the Nilson Manila. And even though the war in Ukraine makes everything worse, as with the rising price of the, the gold, the miners want to explore more the forest. And it, it, it intensifies the legal meaning mining that's already going. It was already a worry. So we are in 2022, and I'm saying the obvious. We need the forest standing, and equity is still a place of for nobody of us. A place to reach, but as much we walk as far we get in this, life, in this time that we are living. And it's not just about mining Brazil. It's about our choices and the world, our health within in our forest, in our planet. And the pressure in indigenous lands put its population in food insecurity, by the way. There is this also malaria, mercury contamination, and other risks. The health workers, when in the forest, noted it increased pressure of agriculture, mining, and the government pressure. And this is what happens when some humans have more rights than others. These are some of the activists killed in Brazil in the last few years. And they did they got a chance to get all the names. As the social political environment for health has deteriorated, Simply taking a stand and continuing to work is in the most disadvantaged areas and for the most disadvantaged people constitutes a form of resistance. COVID has increased the health gaps, our health and act time glasses there. I really want to thank you all the colleagues that keep doing the hard work in rural and vulnerable areas of the world. The idea of what we are doing as a rural champion is what we call the survival act activism because of inequity. And we need to reimagine the world. It's urgent. We need to reimagine health. We are part of nature. Rural areas are indispensable in enabling the country to reach all countries to reach net, net zero emissions. Rural farmers, ranchers, forest owners manage large segments of lands that hold enormous opportunities for climate mitigation. You know, I want to survive in this world. 
That's why we need to think not just about urbanization, but about ruralization. We need to, to put this in our, in our speech. So I do really think that the humans are the answer for this as well. And that's why we need rural education, forest education, and for sure, rural healthcare professionals. And it's part of solving the problem, the problem. I will show you a very short video about this, and I just got back to finish. Why do we need rural health workers? Did you know that almost half of the world population lives in rural areas? This includes populations that live near rivers, in forests, deserts, islands, mountainous regions, and other remote areas. Eight out of ten people living in extreme poverty live in a rural area. More than half of the people living in these areas are without adequate access to essential health services. Yet, rural health and access to health services are often neglected in analysis of health status and health system performance. Universal health coverage cannot be achieved without a well trained, motivated, and supported rural health workforce. Addressing the mal distribution of health workers in countries is key to addressing the pervasive inequity in access to health services in rural areas. So, what can we do within a primary health care approach? Health workforce policies and strategies play an important role not only in ensuring better health outcomes, but also in driving community engagement, gender equality, and sustainable economic development. There is a clear need for a whole of society approach to develop, attract, recruit, and retain health workers in rural and remote areas. We must invest in development and training for minds to be more fit for public rural health. Enrolling students with a rural background in health workers' education programs, bringing students in health workers' education programs to rural and remote communities, having health education facilities located in rural areas, and aligning their education with rural health needs. We must protect and support the existing rural health workforce by giving them decent conditions to live and work with access to continuing education, professional development, and attractive career pathways. It is also important to recognize the contribution of this workforce. The guarantee and ensured health needs and remote well-being for all at all ages. We need to have policies to develop, attract, and recruit and retain health workers adapted to the unique realities of rural and remote areas. The newly updated WHO guideline on health workforce development, attraction, recruitment, and retention in rural and remote areas offers a broad view of what can be done to achieve the global principle behind the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and to leave no one behind. So let's think and act in rural areas together. I just got to cry this because there were voices from all around the world playing their great championships for health as well. So it just. It <laughs> I just want uh, to remind us the jellyfish in the Venice Channel during the lockdown. And I want to ask our Rossi's ambassadors that are here to stand. We are changing things, aren't we? So thank you so much for the rural cafes. Rural videos, maternity, rural stories, and all other incredible things that we are constructing. 
and for the, those that are at home as well. I can say we have changed the world since the days of Genesis. And getting to the end of my talk, I use an example of how it's urgent to reimagine the world and the architectural um, intervention of a seesaw created by the Roman to run San Fratello architect. And this seesaw was installed on the border between Mexico and the United States so that children on both sides can play and interact. What a person does on one side has an impact on the other side. That's exactly what a seesaw does. And it goes up and down. That this is what also happens about everything. An indigenous leadership said, we look too much down. Is it possible that we raise our girls up, raise up our heads? It's huge. Do we need more signs? And I do really want to finish my talk with a poem. Invisible. I work with the invisible. The place that people pass and do not notice, that policy makers do not see, that has no lens or degree adjustment to make you see. But it's a dense, invisible of flesh, bone, and blood, of those who work in land, take care of the food, plant, produce, in odd jobs in unemployment. And invisible starving. This invisible one who sits in a chair, have shortness of breath and fear of COVID, will not be possible to work in the land. And invisible accounted for positive gains. And the invisible one who shed tears and that my tired body behind the blue mask and screams and expressed by the queen, the oxygen parameters. I am machine, I'm not human, not human. And the team's endless dark circles around the eyes, and the new internal communication and policy on concrete proteins is pleased myself with their unfunded system. And I take a deep breath if I have that right. And I stood to my hands and it throat scratching me again, myself in this world. Thank you today for not letting me be invisible and let's reduce the negative. Thank you. Very nice to be born. Absolute uh, standard bearer 
uh, for the development of social inclusion policy and services, uh, not only in the Midwest, um, but nationally. Um, so, Patrick, thanks for your amazing contribution to this conference. So we, we, we found funding, funding 